Hey everybody, Martin from Quad Spinner here, and today we're going to take a quick little look at Cellular 3D. So in a previous video, I said we would probably be covering trees as a node for the next tutorial. However, we're working on some of the new features, so we're holding off on it for a little bit until that node is completely ready to cover. As a replacement, we have Cellular 3D, a node that is also quite new to me. However, Dax really loves this node, and we'll probably make a video in the future delving further into it but I'm here to just give you guys a quick rundown on all the cool little things you could do with it. And of course, there's so much more you can explore yourself. So hopefully this video gets you started. So on the surface, it's a rather simple node. The fun lies in the creative ideas that you can do with it. It's an extremely fast node that gives you very cool randomized, like mathematical looking results. And we have a bunch of control over the randomization on each axis, scale on each axis, and small things like gap and size. So yeah, for me, the main strong points with this node is that it's lightning fast and it gives you unique shapes. So if we get into the node, um, yeah, we can have a quick look at all these sliders here. So of course we have a size slider, which simply scales the shape. Then we have a gap slider. When it's larger than zero, it creates a gap between each unique hash. So the hash are these blocks. You can create super cool shapes with this gap. We also have an input on this node that controls the gap so we can actually mask out where the gap you know is what size with a black and white mask one and zero values we can actually mask where the gap is one so the size you put on the slider and zero where it's completely closed off using that we can get some pretty interesting shapes which i'll show you in a second we have jitter sliders these jitter the points across the certain axis uh, jittering kind of being a randomizing factor as you might say so basically if we turn it up all the way to one each of these kind of well points which would normally just be kind of square will like kind of get pushed and pulled in different directions creating these very unique shapes and the fact that we have control over each axis can give us some interesting results which i'll show right now as you can see if i just turn everything off except for the z which i'll have on for a little bit you'll see that we get these little squares and once we start adding jitter in certain axis you'll see that the actual shapes become very randomized we have scale sliders these simply give you control for the scale along each axis then we have a seed input and we have a normalized input this button normalizes the input shape which somewhat rescales the input shape into something between a zero and one standard range this is normally used if we have a very outlandish shape and we want to have the cellular 3D follow this shape more accurately. Now for the examples I prepared for you guys, we are going to start off with a rock debris field. So we're going to mix various cellular 3D nodes together and then have slight gaps in between them and then warp them and then throw them in a seamless node into a repeat node and then we transpose this on whatever shape we want in our case a slump so what you can see here is we have the bigger node and then two of these smaller nodes and we're just maxing each one out and then warping it and this already gives us a rocky shape which we then just transpose and you have this huge debris field and why would we use this over something like you know a node that is specifically catered to creating this rock debris field well, it's lightning fast. While there's like rock noise and all that kind of stuff in Gaia, these kind of more simulation slash texture methods are often a bit heavier to process. And this kind of mathematical equation results that we're kind of creating here, they're lightning fast. You know, it's it computers, if computers are good at anything, it's, it's math. You get these insanely good results so quickly if you need a PBR texture that you're making or you just need to have a rock debris field on a terrain that you're creating. This is a consideration. So the next one we have is our drought crack. So when you have like a river bed that's been uh, dried up, you'll have these kind of weird cracks in the well riverbed sand mud. I don't know what exactly it is. So when we make these drought cracks, what we're going to do is just have a cellular 3D um, and then the gap, we're going to have a quite a, you know, quite a strong gap here. And we're going to height remap it to be quite flat. We're going to warp this result, which is already kind of going to give us the look. And I'm going to transpose it over something. It's not 100% one to one, but it's a good start. And it also kind of reminds me of other looks, but definitely has that kind of drought cracked look as well. So yeah, this is one way you could use it. 
Next we have a low poly rock base. So we're gonna get a radial gradient and we're gonna, well, make the edges even flatter. And then I use the normalized input here and put the size that was 0 0.05 and don't touch anything else. And I have this like cool low poly, like spiral rock base. This could be great if you bring it into Houdini or any other software, remesh this and wanna scope further. This could be a great start or you could see this has come some kind of like Citadel. I don't know, it's giving me like weirdly kind of Minas Tirith vibes. Um, yeah, just very interesting shapes. I personally really like this low poly starter and then you can add a bunch of stuff on top. However, I am going to note that you'll see this kind of like banding, which if you work in Gaia, we're working with height maps. So when something is completely vertical, that is going to expose, well, this banding because it's straight up literal pixels, as you can see here. And the thing is, if we add, de if we add detail, we cannot really add detail on these very vertical places. So if you want to work with this further and add detail in Gaia, I highly recommend blurring it a bit, softening those edges. The more you blur it, the more uh, easy it will be to work with these vertical edges because we're actually kind of creating less vertical edge. So there's actually a bit of space for the height map to add some details onto. So yeah, do that if you must. Boom. So now there's actual space for these little stratifications to be shown on these uh, more vertical parts of the stone. So uh, after this, I'm going to show you guys a endless rocky desert. This one is very simple. It's just a cellular 3D basically base shape. And we're just going to throw a heavy erosion on it. And you get this weirdly desolate shape. So as you can tell, I'm just kind of playing around. And there's something odd about this thing because it doesn't make any sense. It's very, the shape of course is very unnatural. Um, it's not something that you'll ever get in nature. So when you erode it, the shape I got, it gives me this kind of depressing, endless void kind of vibe because there's no real way anywhere. There's no waterways that you can follow out of here. The little gaps here, the little like hole parts, they kind of turn into these little, little crater fields almost, uh, which I thought was very cool. But yeah, especially just the feeling of just isolation on this this part right here. I could totally see like Matt Damon being out here uh, in the Martian or something, just lost in space as he always is. If you take this mountain shape and we just plug it into the cellular 3D with a high gap, all of a sudden we have this city. Um, yeah, if you're looking for a really quick and dirty way, in a sense, to create a city backdrop, and you can just export this and then you can try planar project some window textures and whatever in the background onto these things. Yeah, and of course we can control if these roofs are slanted or not by using the jitter. Super cool, super cool. The next we have an alien valley. So this is kind of where you could see like, I don't know, some Marvel people uh, fighting it out. It's a um, weird alien valley or something. So we get this canyon, I'm plugging it into the cellular 3D, I'm blurring it a bit and warping it a bunch, creating that rock detail. Then using a very low ridge, with like very low height to mix that in using max. So this is gonna be kind of our floor and then just erosion. And here we go. I could totally see some weird like chase happening here with this very claustrophobic rock jutting and maze-like shape. Yeah, you could totally see it happening. Definitely a very interesting ways to create kind of set pieces, more alien style in most of the cases, because it isn't very realistic, the shape, as in realistic for Earth. Next one. This one is unbelievably weird. So Dax showed me this, and it is a radial gradient, which we're inverting, Oop. and we are using the shaper to change it a bit. Now it looks quite mesmerizing, a hole. But then we're plugging it into our cellular 3D, normalizing the input and height remapping. However, we're also using the same shaper. So we're using the same shape, changing it with the shaper to create this weird hat looking thing. Kind of like Thanksgiving looking hat. Um, and then we use that for the gap input and we turn the gap to the max. And what this does is on the edges here, there is no gap because it's, it's a value of zero. However, as we get to the center, the gap becomes bigger and bigger and it kind of creates this weird like alien 
Stonehenge uh, place. I could see some weird alien gods being being uh, worshipped here. It's it's very cool. I thought this shape is just so interesting. It's something I've never really seen before. So yeah, super cool. I liked it a lot. Um, do with it as you wish. So now I'm going to cover how I created this space slug hole or home in Gaia using the cellular 3D. So in the old trilogy, there is a scene where Han Solo parks his Millennium Falcon somewhere he shouldn't have, which it is a hole on a comet or asteroid, which is um, very deep and they're hiding from the Empire. But little do they know, it is actually a worm that they landed in or there was a worm under the dirt. I don't fully remember. But anyway, it was a big hole. And uh, I thought, what better use for the cellular 3D than to create a big hole. So yeah, let's get started. We're gonna start off with the best shape, the radial gradient, and we're gonna plug it into the cellular 3D. We are going to normalize the input here. Then, of course, we're gonna invert it. As you can see, it became a hole. But we're also blurring this quite a lot. I'm height remapping it quite a bit, so it's less, less deep than the invert, and then dropping it to the floor. And after this, we're ready to go to the Erosion 2. So in the Erosion 2, I'm pretty much only changing the Erosion Scale to 500, and I turned the Discharge Angle to 1. What this does is it kind of removes the buildup of the suspended load. It basically doesn't stop flowing until it's all the way at the bottom of this crater, so you basically don't see any little piles of sediment. We only see these hydraulic flows. Next up, we're using a thermal shaper with a scale of five and quite a bit of down cutting on the shape and strong influence. What this will do, as you can see, it is very much sharpening our shape, creating kind of a cool, sharp, rocky look. This is perfect for shaping those heavy hydraulic flows into a more rocky, cool, natural shape. After this, we're going to actually add some rock detail. So we're gonna get the stratify in here pretty much the base settings, only masking out the top part a little bit so it's less intense up here and changing the spacing. But other than that, base settings, and you can see how much that is adding that rock shape. Next up, even more rock shape using the sandstone. All base settings here, just using the seed to find some good chipping on my rock wall. And I really like this right here. After this, we're gonna warp it, very small amounts, just to kind of add a little bit of extra detail on any flat faces left and now thermal two. So we have the thermal two set to the max blend mode. This will make sure that we are just building up sediments here. And the sediment removal is set to a 0 0.01, um, just to kind of get rid of a little bit more. You can also adjust the strength and duration kind of up to you. We have the feature scale set to 15. Just play around with it, see what works for you. When it comes to just using a max blend mode, we're basically just adding sediments and the erosion is not super important so you can play around a lot more. What we're doing now is getting the deposits here and then using an auto level to make sure that we can actually use this mask. And then in erosion 2, I'm going to plug that into the precipitation input here and the erosion, as you can see, it has very low down cutting but a long duration and then high bed load, high core sediments. Basically just all these sediments are enabled too. And we're just doing this for the micro flow detail, as you can see down here. So just a little bit of micro flow detail. And I didn't want the actual rocks to be affected much, so that's why I used the deposit mask to say where the precipitation was. After this, a choke point and a texture base and a sat map. In my case, the 524 on the rock adjusted the saturation and lightness. After this, ran it through a curve for a lot more contrast blended that back in, realizing that the contrast of the color also got in increased. So even though the curve will show you a black and white image, it is also changing the contrast of the color or the hue. Then we're using HSL to kind of kick back on that color because it's too strong. We're gonna use a light X node at the end here to see our texture in all its glory, but also to kind of give it a space look. So. We're using the sun intensity 1.5, but the ambient intensity of 0.5, because in space, I don't know, there's not much bounce lighting. We also turn off the air density, and we're getting this very contrasty space lighting. So yeah, perfect. We can really see that rock details adding a lot of cool detail on our clips. 
Of course, if we need more, you're probably going to either have to use bump mapping or you're going to have to displace it instead of Houdini, or you could even remesh and sculpt this. So it's all up to you guys. But uh, yeah, even the height map has a lot of detail. And I love these little rocky bits at the bottom here. Look very cool. Kind of looks like a cave, doesn't it? Uh, perhaps you should not enter this cave. That's just a suggestion. If you want to find out what's in there, be my guest. Kind of looks like a uh, worm sticking out from the sand. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this build and I hope you learned a lot about cellular 3D. I will say for me, cellular 3D really made me think twice about how I use Gaia and what kind of shapes I can create in the software. It really broadened my horizon as to what's possible. And it really goes to show that this software is really capable of a lot. And if you're just creative and play around, there's so much this software can offer you. So yeah, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you had your creativity sparked by this video. And I will work hard to get that trees video out to you guys, hopefully by the next one. Or if not, you know, you'll hear from me in the next video. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned a lot and I'll see you next time.